We're going to introduce Mary Doyle next. So, just to give you a bit on her. North Belfast Republican Mary Doyle was first sent to Armagh's Women Jail for Republican activities in May 1974, when she was just 18 years old. At that stage, we had political status, she recalled. During her time in prison, her poor mother was murdered by the UVF. So sorry about that. She was released in September in 1976, and political status for prisoners had been withdrawn in March of that year. Mary was sent back to jail in September 77, when she was told that political status was gone and that she was just an ordinary criminal. So tonight, Mary shares with us her experiences as a strong Republican woman, both in prison and outside, as she partook in the struggles in Northern Ireland. Mary Doyle. Um, before I start, can I ask Catherine to come up here a minute, please? Catherine, um, for you and your coming, just the, the women that have come down the day would like to present to you that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Right, I, I really don't know what I'm going to say after them three women. I'm just, and um, say everything I was going to say, you've already said it, so, but haven't I? I've got the accent. I'm just going to um, deal my personal uh, um, in jail. Um, as you rightly said, I first went in the jail um, March 74. Um, I received five years. We then were recognised for all our political prisoners. So, um, and as you rightly said, the biggest thing that happened to me personally, my mummy was murdered by the UVF. Her and my daddy had not out um, to the wee local bar for a couple of drinks on Thursday evening. And then um, what the UVF were doing in those days was going in shooting all around and throwing the bomb. Unfortunately, my mummy was coming out to go to the shop for someone. She was always doing a good deed for somebody and got caught up in it. Um, she was killed instantly. Uh, one of them, one of the UVF men, he lost a leg, and, but he died about 10 days later. Two of them were arrested and um, were given the Secretary of State. But there was three men, um, each, each uh, lost a limb each lost a leg each and two, one of them was a Protestant you know this was a wee local bar um, just outside North Belfast Greencastle and both Catholics and Protestants drank in it but they claimed you know that it was a Republican bar but anyway um, I was given 24 hours parole because I did have <coughs> political status to bury my mama. Um, it obviously was a very hard time my daddy wasn't in great health I uh, had two younger brothers uh, I was 19 at the time, my brother Q was 18 and um, my brother Martin was 11. So it was, it was hard on the family. But I must say, um, the comradeship in, within the jail did keep me going. Um, we, 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 were, we were always there for one another, you know, and I mean, some, some of you would have had good days, bad days, um, especially, you know, if somebody wasn't well or, I mean, like there, there was um, family members who died. Others had happened to other prisoners, you know. But you, the women were um, were always there for you, and um, that, that really did help. I mean, when we had the uh, status, Eileen Hickey, Lord of Mercy Honour, she was the the jail OC, and then we had wing OCs and adjuncts, and the jail run very far, very smoothly because we had no dealings with the, the screws. Uh, if we needed something, um, we would have went to the, the wing OC or the alien um, who dealt with them. And it worked both ways, you know. Um, 
So then, as I say, I got out then September 76, nearly spent a full year out and was back in again. And the screws and the governor took great pleasure and saying, you know, it's all changed now, and you, you know, you're a common criminal. You know, you laughed at them. Um, then in Armagh, um, there was a no work protest because there was no uniform. So that's why, unlike the men, you know, that wouldn't wear the uniform, um, they were wearing the blanket. So it was just, though, at them when I went in, it was the no work. So I got sentenced then, I was under mom 14 months and got eight years, so then I automatically went on to the no work protest. So uh, that was just, you were locking your cell all day, and then you got out, even an association was called, you would have um, cleaned your cell, done your washing, had a bath, you know, went to the association, um, there was two association rooms um, with a TV in each of them. And um, during, not long before February um, 1980, we were in the association room um, watching the news and it was the first time they had let a film crew into the H-blocks. I mean, most of, I think every one of us wrote to somebody in the blocks, or m more than one, and so we knew what was going on. I mean, you were hearing the stories and about the bad beatings and, and what they were going through. But as I say, it came on the news and it showed you it. And they actually see it with your own eyes, you know, the living conditions that the men um, were in and, you know, they're stand with their um, blankets and beards and the long hair and all. I didn't even realise it. The tears was tripping me. And I was going, oh my God, how can they do that? You know, I, I just could, you know, I was saying, God love them, you know, and I, that's not one, one thing they wouldn't have wanted. wouldn't have wanted pity, like, but um, I just couldn't get over it. So, um, this went on, I mean, the men had already been on the, on the, the, the no wash a couple of years. So then, February um, 1980, and male and female screws come in to do a general raid. And um, we came in at lunchtime, and there was women, sort of, we were in, there was three wings, and um, there was women all over the place, but you were in, um, because it was lunchtime, you were looking over to see because we depended on the, the prison food because we weren't allowed parcels. And the male and female screws came running in in their rag gear. And there were some women like injured getting trailed downstairs and we were um, through into both association rooms. Red Farley, who was OC at the time, was the man to speak to the, the governor and to find out what was going on and what have you. So um, their excuse for coming in was to get our black gear, which was black polar necks and black skirts, which came through the censors. You know, they weren't smuggled in because we wore them, um, say, at Easter commemoration or if a volunteer um, was killed, we would have had a, a commemoration out in the yard. So we were locked up in the um, association rooms and they went in and wrecked all our cells. Now we had very little in our cells um, because you're only allowed so many personal, you know, photographs and letters and what have you. But what we did have, they ruined them. And they eventually let us out one at a time to go back to our cells. And there was two rows of male screws and we had to walk, walk through them and they were kicking and, you know, hitting and, and all this. So, I mean, during this whole time, Maraid um, was demanding that to speak to the governor and see what the hell was going on and we hadn't even been fed or, or anything. So this went on. Then the three um, sandwiches in their cell, the, the, but we all eventually then were put in, locked up in their cells. And I mean, most cells, it was two women in together and I mean all we had was one we called the poet chamber pot and it only holds so much. So Maraid was asking about getting out to the, the bathrooms and was totally ignored. And then it was a couple of days later, um, I mean obviously then the <clears throat> the chamber pots was getting um <coughs> threw out onto the, the wing and the screws then started brushing it back in under ourselves. 
So um, a couple of days later, then they eventually left four of us out of the time to our hour because you were entitled to an hour's exercise. And the first place we run to was the bathroom and it was locked. So to cut a long story short, that was how the no wash started in Armagh. We didn't choose it, it was forced upon us. So then um, we were moved to another wing. We were moved to A wing, that was we had been in B wing. And then that's when we started putting the excreta on the wall. Now, it, it wasn't easy, you know, um, but it was one of those things you learned to live with, you learned just to get on with it. I mean, I've always found, um, and particularly I think with Republican women, that um, when your back's against the wall, you're at your strongest. And that's the way we were. So we endured that. Um, we were still then being allowed out in two groups for our exercise. So Sheila was adjunct at the time. She more than likely was with one group, and Maria, who was OC, was with the other group. So during that whole summer, um, there was talk about, you know, what's going to happen next. And because there was great communication between the movement outside and the blacks. There was comms coming in daily. And um, so we knew what they were thinking and what was going on. And then we knew that the men were, were talking about a hunger strike. So we started to discuss it um, among ourselves. I mean, the, the movement didn't want a hunger strike. Didn't want any, anybody on a hunger strike. The men didn't want the women on them. But, um, and it wasn't that they were being the macho types or anything like that. They were just, they looked at us, you know, like the sisters, they wanted to protect us or whatever, you know, it was nothing, um, not thinking that we couldn't do it or whatever. <clears throat> so we were told, the women, I mean, this was within our own group, that to go away and think about it long and hard, and then whoever wanted to put their name forward. I mean, obviously, I couldn't just consider myself. I, I thought about my daddy, um, my brothers, um, and all that they've been through and, and what have you. But um, I think uh, Martina used that expression earlier, you know, don't, do, don't expect someone to do something you're not prepared to do. So that was the way I looked on it, and I, I put my, my name down. Now, um, it, it was hard to tell my daddy, but my daddy just said to me, I knew you'd do it. You know, it was just... So, um, the men, the seven men went on it on the 27th of October. And um, it was decided then, Maria Farr and Margaret Nugent and myself, we would go on it on the 1st of December. So when it was announced that morning, um, they put the three of us in a double sail which was great because we had each other's company and, you know, rather than being in a cell, because like some of the men, <clears throat> when they first went on hunger strike, they were in with somebody else. And, you know, that must have been so hard for the other prisoner having to watch, you know. But, um, <clears throat> so us three were put in together. Now, um, jail food is notoriously horrible, you know. But all of a sudden then, there was um, large portions of steaming hot dinners arriving because there, wouldn't, uh, you, there was food in your cell 24 hours a day. <clears throat> Brought the breakfast in, they took the previous supper out and then you know, lunch, dinner and supper. You know, it, it was the screws, I personally just believe being petty. Um, <clears throat> We still were on the wing with the other women and um, great support, you know, and the morale was great and everything. Um, we, we were doing a letter camp, campaign at the time that we smuggled letters um, on cigarette papers or toilet roll, whatever you had. And it was um, direct to anyone all over the world, just who you thought could do something or intervene or, or whatever. So um, it was just into the, the second week, they moved us to the so-called hospital wing, which is another double cell in a different part of the jail. 
But we had um, a wee smuggle radio, which we only listened to at night when the screws went off the wing. And it was only, we only listened to the news. So on the 18th, um, I, just, I can never remember, it was the 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock news. Um, the three of us were sitting and the next thing came on, the hunger strikes off, his husband called off. The three of us looked at one and I said, did I hear that right? So we had to wait till the following hour because we weren't in earshot of the other women. And so it said the same. And we were just, we didn't know what was going on. Um, but unknown to us, Danny Morrison um, had tried to get into the jail to explain things and the NIO refused him. So the next morning um, the governor came in with the couple of screws and says, right, I'll choose off hunger strike. And we had looked at him and says, no we're not. And he says, um, well the man's off it. He was like a big chair. And uh, Maria says, well we're not. So we we were still entitled to our, our um, exercise. So to get the exercise yard, you had to go through the uh, wing where the women were. So Maria then said she went in to speak to Sheila, who Sheila was um, doing OC at the time when Maria went on hunger strike. So um, Maria went in and spoke with Sheila. So then I think it was Sheila got a visit. I keep forget. I've seen Night Dementia, by the way. Um, <laughs> And it was explained to us then that um, Danny had tried to get in and all this. So then we decided to come off it. So it was the 19th of December that we came off it. I mean, my first, my own personal thoughts was, oh God, it's, you know, Sean McKenna, because we had heard that um, he, he was really ill. He was going blind and they were, they were afraid of him um, actually even in the coma. So I was delighted for him that he was going to get the medical attention he needed. I was delighted for all the other men too, like, because I think it was, what, it was 52 or 53 days they were on it, and, um, and for their families. Obviously, I was delighted for my own family too. So, I mean, coming up to that Christmas period, um, we were on a high, because obviously, um, we thought our, our demands had been met, our five demands. So, I mean, it was, and then in the new year, when different things happened in the blocks and what have you, and then it was uh, realised then that the Brits had reneged. And it was, it, it was so frustrating, you know, and um, oh, I've, it's hard to put into words, like, when you think that you, you um, were getting what was rightly yours anyway. But anyway then, so there was a the talk about the, a second hunger strike. Now, there was only 32, 33 of us, so we didn't have the numbers that the blacks had. So after discussion, um, and for various reasons, it was decided there wouldn't be um, a hunger strike in Armagh for the second time. And, um, I mean, that was very hard. But I remember getting a, a letter, a wee smuggled call, like from Bobby Sands, saying, he was the happiest man in Long Cash because we weren't going on it. And as I say, he didn't mean that in any, you know, but he, he you know, he was just, Jennifer's explained, he was just an extraordinary person. But um, then when Bobby went on it on the 1st of March, um, then all happened then when he, he was um, elected um, as MP, I mean, our hopes was, was through the roof, that thinking, you know, Maggie Thatcher's not going to let Bobby die now, and we all know. But um, the morning that um, we heard Bobby had died, you know, it was, it was just, you went through every emotion. You were angry, you were sad, you were frustrated, you felt helpless, just everything. But we knew that, you know, we were still Republican prisoners and we weren't going to, you know, let ourselves down or more importantly, let the memory of Bobby down. So, I mean, it wasn't a case of you're going out to bait a screw or something, which, believe you me, that's what we felt like doing. And after, um, after each day, if, 
I mean, it, it didn't become any easier. Um, you still felt all those emotions. And, um, and then when the, the hunger strike was called off, you know, it was a relief, but, you know, all, all, all I could think of was the 10 men's families, you know, and how hard it must be for them. And, but I know that they were, you know, so proud and stood by them. But I mean, eventually then, I mean, then um, from the, I mean, we come off, sorry, I meant to say, we come off uh, the no wash then, the day Bobby started his hunger strike on the 1st of March, because we didn't want to take anything away from it, so we were then back onto the um, no work protest. So, I mean, eventually, over the months, um, we dug away and dug away, and, you know, we uh, went into the, um, what did you call it, the sewing room, um, at the rack of machines, and the best of it is, I want to love to have learned how to use that sewing machine, but this was to go in, to be, you know, to rack it, and then um, they the done away with it then, because, I mean, we obviously would have done our own work, which meant maintaining the wings and, and cleaning that, but eventually, um, that did happen, that we did, so, in, in all, we did get our demands, um, then I, I was released in um, 83, during 83, and um, uh, not long after that I met my late husband, and um, went on to have two children, he ended up, he was in jail all the time, and I know like a yo-yo, but, um, so I had the other side of that experience of then visiting jails, and you see, because I used to go up to him, it used to be a lot, but I used to go up, because you know what, I know how I worried, but I knew he worried about us and the children, and I used to go up and spoof such a load that I had a bank account that would have choked a donkey, and I hadn't two day in my purse, but it was to stop him from worrying, you know, so it is a vicious circle, but, um, I mean, I kept on, and you know, in, in ex-prisoners groups and residence groups, all the community work that all continued. And then um, I worked, um, obviously, it was in Sinn Féin, and then I was co-opted on um, three years ago, and then was um, was sued in 2014 and got elected for North Belfast. So I'm kept bright and busy. So I hope I haven't bored you too much. Stand. <laughs>